John Williams has had arguably the most legendary career in entertainment. He has brought many of your favorite films to life like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and more. Let's break down the incredible career of John Williams. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today, we're doing a huge breakdown on the legendary career of maestro John Williams, the man who's probably become the most influential person in the sound and music of cinema, crafting so many memorable, iconic scores and paving the way for the future of sound starting out in the 60s and 70s and then becoming the most prolific, acclaimed, and adored composer in cinema history. This guy is the GOAT. He's the GOAT. Arguably, he's the GOAT. And it's really insane when you look at his career, especially how long it's been. Uh, starting all the way back in the 1960s, 70s, all the way going to still now. And at 90 years old in 2022, he's still making movies. And today, he's still making movies, coming out of retirement to work on Steven Spielberg, I'm assuming, which will be his last film, John Williams' last film, which will come out in 2026. He said that he's going to keep composing till he dies. Or he'll keep composing until Spielberg stops making movies, I guess. (laughs) So, which is wild, because that's in two years. He'll be scoring a film that comes out in 2026. And he's 92 years old right now, and he's still doing it. Still doing it, still writing by hand. Still putting out some of the best music every year, because he's just a legend. You know, 54 Oscar nominations, five Oscar wins for Fiddler on the Roof, Jaws, Star Wars, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, and Schindler's List. 26 Golden Globe nominations with four wins. 76 Grammy nominations with 26 wins. And 16 BAFTA nominations with seven wins. He has just defined music and cinema. And we have a lot of great contemporary composers who are pioneering the use of new technologies. And I love when tech is used in music production and People like Hans Zimmer and Ludwig and Cliff Martinez are just a few great composers who really toe the line between traditional and electronic tech-based musical composition. But what I love about John Williams is just the simplicity and the purity of his composition. And uh, Michael Giacchino is a contemporary composer who I like to compare with John Williams because they have very similar tendencies and approaches. And John Williams not only being a world-class composer, but also conducting his orchestras as well, which is very rare for composers, especially in the film world. Alexandre de Splat is really the only major contemporary composer who also conducts his own orchestras, which is a whole other beast. So that's another testament to uh, the the impressive, unparalleled talent of John Williams. And there's so many unbelievable films and unbelievable themes. And he, he, he really is just like, you could say the same thing as Hans Zimmer of being just a theme hit machine where those two guys, they just have this innate ability uh, to craft wonderful themes for all of their characters and all of their films. And uh, so many of John Williams themes have lived on throughout decades and will continue to leave, live on throughout decades, whether it be Star Wars, whether it be Harry Potter, whether, whether it be Indiana Jones. Uh, there's so many incredible pieces of music that even for younger people, if they haven't seen a film, they probably might know the music or at least the main melodies and main themes of some of the characters. And so his influence is uh, un- is just unwavering and uh, will never be met again. I think that just his bulk of work and his impact on cinema is as heavy as you could say so- some of the greatest directors of all time. Like John Williams is up there with the impact on the actual art form. Probably. And John Williams, like many great artists or musicians, they come from a lineage and family of musicians. He was born in Flushing, Queens, New York City. And he was born to Esther and Johnny Williams. Johnny, his father, was a jazz drummer and percussionist who played with the Raymond Scott Quintet. He also has an older sister, Joan, and two younger brothers, Jerry and Don, who play on his film scores. Wow. On his lineage, Williams has said, My father was a main man. We were very close. My mother was from Boston. My father's parents ran a department store in Bangor, Maine. And my mother's father was a cabinet maker. Johnny Williams collaborated with Bernard Herman. And his son sometimes joined him in rehearsals, Whoa! which is pretty incredible. Little John Williams hanging out with Bernard Herman. That's oh pretty epic. God. Now, in 1948, the Williams family moved to Los Angeles, where John attended North Hollywood High School, graduating in 1950. He later attended the University of California, Los Angeles, and studied composition privately with an Italian composer, Mario 
Mario Castelnuovo de Chesco. Williams also attended Los Angeles City College for one semester as the school had a jazz band, but in 1951, he was drafted into the U.S. Air Force where he played the piano and brass and conducted and arranged music for the U.S. Air Force Band as part of his assignments. And in a 2016 interview with the U.S. Air Force Band, he recounted having attended basic training at Lackland Air Force Base, after which he served as a pianist and brass player with secondary duties of making arrangements for three years. In March 1952, he was assigned to the Northeast Command 596th Air Force Band stationed at Pepperell Air Force Base in St. John's, Newfoundland. He also attended music courses at the University of Arizona. And then following his Air Force service in 1955, he moved to New York City and entered into Juilliard, where he studied piano with Rosina Lavigne, who was really set to become, originally set to become a concert pianist. But after hearing contemporary pianists like John Browning and Van Killebum perform, he switched to focus on composition. To him, he said, it became clear that I could write better than I could play. Wow. And he started out as an orchestrator in film studios, working for other composers, including Bernard Herrmann, as orchestrators for their, their mu- basically helping write the music and helping put together the orchestra for uh, the actual performances for those scores. And then he started out in the 60s, uh, late, late 50s and early 60s, with some smaller film scores and then breaking out big with Fiddler on the Roof was the big one for him. Winning the Oscar. It's a really world-renowned musical, incredible filmmaking, uh, a remarkable story. It's like a three-hour epic. You can actually watch it on Amazon Prime right now. It's on Prime. It's a wonderful film. And so that really put him on the map in Hollywood. And then after that, he did Jaws. Uh, But there's so many scores he's done. His filmography, it's over 100 films. I believe it's 120 films he's worked on. So we're obviously not going to get into all these films because I haven't seen them all. It would just it would be a seventeen hour podcast. Yeah, we're not episode. gonna do that. So we'll discuss the ones we've seen, as well as what we like about his music, our favorite moments, our favorite themes, uh, his most underrated scores. But I'd like to start off with this question: He's made so many great scores. He's I feel like five Oscar wins seems low. It does seem low. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing when I read out the Oscar wins, and it's only five. So I I and to think of how he hasn't won one since Schindler's List. Yes, almost thirty years now. But 30 years. over, Yeah, it's How do you not time. win for Sorcerer's Stone? So I think that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is one of the great contemporary compositions of our time. And it could be probably the greatest score of the century. Uh, what he did really transcended uh, anything that had been done in, bef- in film before. And the musical tone and melodies he created, the, the incredible instruments he used. Uh, but it's just a landmark score and a landmark piece of music that will live on in pursue it will over overcome the test of time just like um, some of his other scores have and I really do think Hedwig's theme is it's one of my favorite pieces of music ever written and it's something that there's so much to it there's so many so much depth to it uh, it's just a it's beautiful it's epic it's it's in, it's welcoming it's inviting uh, also capturing the essence of the magic in the theme and tone of the of the story and giving the audience is something that uh, you, you can't help but be adorned by and when you hear that theme and when you hear that music uh, for me in particular it just warms my soul and gives me such a positive energy and uh, it, it's something it's not just because I love the books and the in the films but because this piece of music is really so special so him not winning an Oscar for Sorcerer's Stone I find is just one of the oddest uh I wouldn't say, I, I, probably the biggest one of the biggest snubs of the century you can't help but not deny that and on top of that um, Jurassic Park wasn't even uh, nominated for Best Original Score. And Jurassic Park has become a sensational theme and piece of music that people adore, uh, that people hum, that uh, has defined uh, cinema in a lot of ways. And the Jurassic Park theme is an otherworldly theme, and it's so incredible, and it, it's just it's bountiful and, and so resonant and, and inspiring, and, and, and it's just like a piece of music that really uh, made that film soar just like Sp- Spielberg's other film Jaws which uh, John Williams score just really lifted it up to a new heights when it comes to Sorcerer's Stone I think it's there's the only reason why or there's actually I think a legitimate reason why he didn't win because he lost to Howard Shore for Fellowship of the Ring Oh, so when it comes to a head-to-head battle, yeah. oh my God, Shit. that's a flip coin, toss yeah. of the coin. You know, who, oh my do you, God. who do you pick for the better score, Fellowship of the Ring or Sorcerer's Stone? Oh They're my both God. 
all-time scores. Maybe the two best scores of the century they could be. I probably would say yes to that, honestly. And I'm, I'm curious who he lost to for Chamber of Secrets because he, he didn't get, get no nominated. He got nominated for Azkaban and Sorcerer's Stone. That's it for Pondus. Yeah, um, Chamber of Secrets is also sensational. Yeah. That's an incredible score as well. I think it's maybe one of his most underrated, to be honest. But, but Azkaban, Sorcerer's he really mixed it up. Yeah, he went jazzy, yeah. very... Uh, cool and hip and, and, and a lot of energy, just like the film. A lot of new sounds in that one. Uh, it's a tragedy that he never continued doing the Harry Potter scores, unfortunately. So I read that he wanted to come back for Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2. However, the studio, when they decided to split it up into two films, they couldn't. They didn't think he could. they could afford him, is what I found online, mm -hmm. even though he wanted to do it. And they got Alexander Desplat, who did a wonderful job. And he is, obviously, if you're going to get someone to do that film, at that time, like Desplat was uh, probably at the top of anyone's list to do it. And so he and the spot score is really great and beautiful and, and worked really well for those films. Um, but it still would have been nice to have John Williams finish the franchise that he helped start and helped birth. Yeah. Because the Hedwig's theme, he made that song for the trailer. So Chris Columbus and Warner Brothers, they reached out to him. They hired him for the job, but they're like, can you make a piece of music for our trailer that we're going to drop um, in, in a couple months? And so he made Hedwig's theme, sent it to Chris Columbus, and Chris Columbus said, that's the score. He's probably like, oh, my God. He's like, holy shit. Oh, my God. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Damn. Damn. Woo. Damn. Woo. I asked for a trailer song, but holy shit, John. So that's what that's where Hedwig's theme came from. It's just the trailer. He music he made for the trailer that was just so brilliant that they were just like, can you please do this for the whole fucking movie? And that's how that came about. It's, it's really special, and the themes he created for that movie are sensational, but... He's done this with so many IPs and so many franchises and so, and so many movies. And especially when you, when you talk about Star Wars, for sure, you can't speak about that franchise without talking about John Williams because he's done the music for every single one uh, of the main nine. Yeah. And it was and, his uh, third Oscar for A New Hope. Yeah. So he is part of the DNA of Star Wars. He, Star Wars wouldn't be the same without John Williams' music. He, it's so special. And the Luke's themes, Leia's themes, Yoda's themes, and then obviously what he's done with the new franchise. It's Ray's themes really sensational. And so Star Wars would not be the same without John Williams. But so wouldn't Steven Spielberg's career. You know, Steven Spielberg and John Williams, you can't talk about either one without the other. They are so ingrained, they're so connected. So much of his movies are scored by John Williams. Everything except for three movies are, oh, yeah. are scored by John Williams for Steven Spielberg's career. And they sort of have this great connective tissue with, with telling stories of how to get the audience in tune with your characters, with the stories, with the beats, the, the climaxes, the ups and downs. They really play so well together. And they're, they're so important to each other, I think, in, in their filmmaking processes. And music is absolutely integral. Sound is the most important part of any movie. And music is part of the sound, obviously, and it's so integral to your film. And I think that Spielberg understands that, which is why he gets Johnny every time he makes a movie, except for three, except for three of and Spielberg's it, it, movies. And you can feel it. You can tell the difference. Yeah. You know, Alan Silvestri. Ready Player did, One. Did, yeah. Alan Silvestri did a great job with Ready Player One, but you know, you can tell it's a little different because it's not it's not John. There's the, they have a symbiosis, and there's something special. Because Spielberg's filmmaking is so specific and so unique, and you need he, you need John Williams' music to really make audiences click with it. And there's just something with the two of them together. There is a timelessness to all of their films, and it goes down to the j the picture just as well as the music. There's this timeless quality to it. And then when you watch his their last film, The Fablemans, it just still has that, and it just feels like it's. It could have been made 40 years ago because they, th this quality to the combination of Spielberg and, and Williams is just probably the greatest pairing of two artists in cinema history, just overall artists in cinema. The Might two be of them in the arts in general. Yeah, yeah and it's just it's just a wonderful collaboration. And uh, John Williams scores. I think that it the he also. A composer is influenced by the film. They're making music for the film. And there's rare, rare instances where directors will have the composer write music before the film. Uh, Terrence Malick likes to operate that way, and he'll have composers make the music before he even shoots. And so the, the uh, Thin Red Line by Hans Zimmer, uh, Des Splat's The Tree of Life, uh, all those films, they, uh, Malick likes to have composers make the music first. Uh, generally, for the rest of the time, 
composers are beholden to the to the picture, and they're beholden to the beats, the story beats, the character beats, and so and that's what makes it so different from classical music, where classical music, it's written uh, in a long format, and so the movements and, and the changes, uh, they are motivated by the the act, the, just the approach and the motivation of the music. That's what's motivating it. Or unless it's written for the stage, for or a theater. For stage, that's what I mean. But yeah. when when it's written for yeah. a, it's just a story, piece, yeah. when it's written for a story, it's it's beholden to the beats of the story, mm-hmm. and it's beholden to the camera work, it's beholden to the to the editing and the performances. And so, uh, in many ways, since Spielberg is arguably one of the greatest, the greatest, or one of the greatest directors of all time, his his filmmaking clearly inspires something special in John Williams uh, because even other John Williams scores you you can't help but argue that the Spielberg and Star Wars scores are the most famous the most well known but there's something about the pairing of them where it creates this incredible symbiosis of artistry that uh, even in his other works uh, it, it transcends those when Spielberg is driving the story and Williams is making the music for that there's just something special there and when you have Spielberg, who's probably the greatest big event director of all time, his movies, not always, he's made small films, but in general, when it comes to a big event director, who's bigger and better than Steven Spielberg? In terms of longevity over the last 50 years, it's Spielberg. You know, yeah. Raiders Lost Ark. We have, I mean, in the Ann Jones franchise, he's got all of his great science fiction films, E.T., you know, even This Century, Minority Jaws. Report, Jaws. Yeah. And when it comes to big event cinema, creating the summer blockbuster or the worlds oh yeah when you have a director who makes the visuals and the story bringing it's it's built for massive audiences massive audience appeal you need a composer that can match you as well and bring in that big event music big event appeal for a mass audience and john williams can do that and they match so well together but also big event composing i mean the star wars movies nine star wars movies that will live on forever some of them are the, some of the best movies ever made. Massive, massive, biggest event movies every time they come out. Every time there's a new Star Wars movie, it's the event of the year. It really is. And who's scoring the music? John Williams, obviously. He's been there since day one. It all started with his music. Yeah. You know, the opening title credit roll, The Crawl. It's it was his bombastic, earth shattering music. Can you imagine being in a theater back then when the first <laughs> Star Wars movies came? Star Wars movie came out in 1977. When a new hype, oh, just Star Wars came out, and you're in the theater, you never seen anything quite like that before. Then, bam, bum, ba-dum, ba-dum, bum, 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 bum. that must have been life changing moment for yeah. so many people in person. The balls on those guys, <laughs> <laughs> for real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so George Lucas, he's so ingrained as well with John Williams in his career for sure. Yeah. Obviously, he's made movies outside of Star Wars, but not. Really, since making Star Wars, has he really done anything outside of it? And even even the contemporary Star Wars films, the music is still incredible. You know, obviously, the most renowned themes that he's crafted for the franchise are like Luke's theme, uh, Leia's theme, Binary the, Sunset, Binary Sunset, the March. Uh, but even Ray's theme is phenomenal. Kylo Ren's theme is fantastic. There's, uh, there's just that's been the consistency, even when the films aren't consistent. You can rely on the music. Duel of the Fates, like, oh my god, it's unbelievable. And it, it, there's just something that... It Star, Star Wars films don't feel right without his music. And there have been good composers that have composed for the other films. You have John Powell. He did Solo, A Star Wars Story. And then Giacchino did Rogue One. Uh, Nicholas Bertel has been doing Andor. And that music's really great as well. Uh, I can't remember who did um, Obi-Wan. But Note Williams composed the theme for Obi-Wan, the opening credit theme. Uh, there's just something that when he's not doing the music for Star Wars, a Star Wars IP project, uh, whether it be TV series or film, it just doesn't feel right. That's how important his music is to the franchise. And, t- and that's just me as a viewer. And- I- I'm sure other people are fine with it. But for me, when I watch something that's Star Wars based and it's not the music by Williams, it just it just doesn't quite register correctly for me. And even outside of IPs or movies that were supposed to be just one-offs that turned into franchises like Home Alone, the yeah. music in that movie is terrific. It's so sensational. That one sort of can be swapped with Sorcerer's Stone. A lot of the same elements and themes going on there as mm-hmm. well. And then also a movie like E.T., The Extraterrestrial. One Fuck of the yeah. best scores he's ever created. Absolutely sensational. So memorable. And it's it's mind-blowing how many themes he's created that people can 
just off the top of their head, just sing out the sound they can hum to. They can think in their minds the important theme, the main theme of these great, great films and how unique they are. Obviously, the same kinds of instruments that he likes to use, same motifs, but then just making it and telling the the, the story of music in a different way, just with several different notes, just rearranging those notes in, in particular order. And he's still on top of the game. His last two scores were nominated for Oscars. So Indiana Jones, Dial of Destiny, and The Fablements. So he's, he hasn't lost any steam, and he's still pushing the boundaries. I mean, some of the stuff in Dial of Destiny is fabulous. Some really wonderful scores in that. Uh, some really incredible themes. There's some really cool facts about him. He apparently was originally set to score The Shining. No way. Until Stanley Kubrick decided to go with selection of music uh, already made. Uh, and so that film's just... Uh, and then they had the theme for the music, but otherwise... It was all like Penderecki and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They they had been experimenting with the first ever synthesizers for yeah. The Shining. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who the composer was that she was sort of a pioneer for synthesizers, but she did the opening with another partner. Yeah, for the, for The Shining. But that's really interesting. Interesting that John Williams almost scored The Shining. I wonder what that would have been like because he has, he never worked with Kubrick, did he? Never. I don't, I don't think he ever worked with Stanley Kubrick. Never. But Stanley Kubrick has a very specific tone. He and, often uses selected music for all yeah, his films. Yeah, he, he does. That's always he does been his that thing. quite a bit. He he uh, he seldom had original scores in his films. Of course, here and there, but when it came to his most iconic movies, I, he didn't really have that many original scores. I mean, when you talk about The Shining, or 2001: A Space Odyssey, there's some original music here and there, but when it comes to an entire film just based around original compositions, it, it wasn't really his thing. And John Williams actually, I think, could have pulled it off really well because he's he's never really done, you strictly say, a horror film. But he does horror well. Uh, Ready Player One, the Shining sequence, great music. And the films he'll work on... Yeah, some... but that wasn't John Williams. And Ready Player One? Alan Silvestri did Ready Oh, Player you're right. One. Fuck, yeah. never mind. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> but he has done horror well. Yeah. War of the Worlds. Jaws. Jaws. A bunch of other great films. Okay, so I'm sorry. He did the most iconic horror theme ever but <laughs> he never really did a after jaws a horror film because spielberg never really did a horror film yeah. per se. yeah i guess war of the worlds is the closest thing to a horror movie because that does get very scary those brass themes he did for the tripods that's that, terrifying that's terrifying yeah so he can do horror um there's some horror in uh, like artificial intelligence there's some scary stuff uh, but he he he, he puts Incredible horror themes in his in films. Chamber of Secrets is a horror movie, bro. Yeah, it's a it monster. A it's movie. a monster movie. You're right. You're right. Now, I want to break down. Let's break down his his films that we've seen in a row. Oh, okay. So we'll go from the earliest that we've seen. So Fiddler on the Roof, uh, I already said, uh, that's the earliest film that I've seen that he did. Uh, it's a great musical. Uh, it's it's fantastic. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's it's a wonderful film. Uh, next up, The Long Goodbye from Robert Altman. Incredible movie. Came out in 1973. And the score is very minimalist uh, compared to other John Williams scores, but it, it really helps the film big time. And it's a wonderful film. One of Robert Altman's most uh, underrated, underappreciated gems for sure. Have you ever seen The Poseidon Adventure, 1972? I've never seen the original. I want to see it. I was talking about it with somebody the other day, and they can't recommend it enough. But I didn't even know John Williams did the score until just this episode. Now you do. And then, yeah. obviously, in 1975, he won his second Academy Award with Jaws. And I just watched Jaws uh, in a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, when I was back in Boston. I watched it. And it's one of my most watched films. It's one of my favorite films. And there's, there's so much to that score. That really changed everything. Obviously, the simplicity of the theme. Obviously, the, the impending strings. Uh, and there's so many levels to it. But also, there's a great amount of adventure in that score, especially in the second half of the film when it's basically the hunt sequences. And there's so much... It's just like it feels horror, like a horror film and an adventure film at the same time. And it really comes down to the music really capturing tone uh, for the audience to feel those things. I agree. Let's move on to 1977, where we have, of course, Star Wars, the first film, and then also Close Encounters of the Third Kind. At the same year. Same year. Oh, my God. He was competing against himself, and Star Wars obviously won, but Close Encounters, if it had come out the year before, would have won. 
Absolutely. He also had a great 1978. He did The Fury for Brian De Palma, Jaws 2, and Superman. Okay, Superman getting into the superhero game. It's one of the themes where it's probably the most hopeful theme ever written, the Superman original theme. It's up there. It's just, when you hear it, it's inspiring. It's, it's It just fills you with um, dun, dun, incredible... Dun, yeah. dun, 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 yeah, it's pretty great. But also, I mean, it's just the drums in that are great too. I love the percussion in that film. Then 1979, we have Dracula, and also 1941 from Steven Spielberg. But getting into the 1980s, we are really cooking big time. Oh so we God. have 1980, we have The Empire Strikes Back, this is Star Wars Episode Five, as well as Raiders of the Lost Ark, both in the same year. What a fuck! No, not 18, 1980 and Oh, you sorry, 1981 for Raiders so, of the Lost Ark. Empire, our favorite Star Wars film, the best, the one. best Star Wars film, best Star Wars movie ever. It also has the the best music in the Star Wars film because we got a bunch of the 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 themes that he created in, in the New Hope. But then we finally got the March. Raiders March. I mean the the Emperor's <laughs> March. So we got finally got Vader's theme in this film, which was not uh, present in A New Hope. The Imperial March. Imperial March, sorry. Sorry, like, guys. Emperor. Who's the Sorry, Dawson. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jacob. <laughs> the Imperial March. And there's so much action in this one compared to the first one. And there's such a great incredible pace to this film. The world bouncing uh, the visual effects are insane uh, but john williams music really helps propel that forward and there's really uh, it leaps and bounds above anything that had been done before what he did with a new hope and with empire strikes back and in terms of like i think that still when you hear his music in the contemporary ones it shows that just because something is science fiction just because something's set in the future doesn't mean the music has to be tacky or electronic you can still have the traditional classical music, and it still works. Yeah. Also, we got Yoda's theme. Yoda's theme. Oh, my! that might be... Honestly, Yoda's theme might be my favorite in the Star Wars franchise. Yeah, let's keep going through the 1980s because yeah. it just gets better and better. So then in 1982, we have E.T., the extraterrestrial, as well as in 1983, we have Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Oof. Then we're going into 1984, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Then 1987, we have Empire of the Sun. As well as returning to Superman, he did Superman for the quest for peace. So he didn't do two and three. And then in 1989, he did Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, as well as Born on the Fourth of July. And in between these, he did a lot of other smaller movies as well. Yeah. So Empire of the Sun is probably, I would say, one of his more underappreciated scores. And a few of his other ones that don't get much recognition, Memoirs of a Geisha, is unbelievable. Uh, seven years in Tibet. He did Memoirs of a Geisha instead of Chambers, Gob in, Goblet of Fire. Goblet right? of Fire, yeah. So he turned down Goblet of Fire to do Memoirs of a Geisha. I wish he didn't. Yeah, but Memoirs is great. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's so, Harry Potter. So I made a tweet. This is like months ago, and I said, I would. I, I tweeted, I would love to hear John Williams make the scores for the Harry Potter films he didn't originally work on, because I think it would be awesome to, yeah. hear, to hear what he would come up with. And I, a couple of people were like. Gave me so much hate for it. Like this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I was like, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious. It's, I mean, I think it would be awesome to hear what he would have done with those films. Me too. Another, it, another reality. Yeah, exactly. It's not. I mean, it, it would be so cool to see what he would write for those, for those films for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the Book Thief, which is a more modern film of his, is a wonderful score. Seven Years in Tibet, starring Brad Pitt. Incredible, incredible score. And then Minority Report, I think, is one that flies really under the radar with underappreciated scores. Do you have any that you think are just, like, nobody talks about but you love to listen to? I would say Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. It's a it's a score that's hard to find. You can not you can only listen to it. I think if you On bought YouTube. the CDs. But even the YouTube yeah. playlist doesn't, only have every, doesn't have a couple tracks. It's more than a couple, but yeah. it doesn't have the full movie on there. But Catch Me If You Can, it's really incredible. It's so playful. It's so light and jazzy. It has really terrific themes and going to his roots of being a jazz musician. It seems like John Williams had the most fun in his, one of the most fun times in his career making that music because mm -hmm. it's so unique. There's nothing quite like the music for Catch Me If You Can. And they have it locked down. Whoever owns the rights to that music, you can't really find it Why? Anywhere. I don't know I don't why. Know. Maybe John owns it. Maybe he does. I have no idea, but... 
you can only find it on YouTube, and it's not the full album. I, you can't find it on Spotify. Maybe you can buy it on Apple. I, I haven't uh-huh. looked yet, but I think you, if you, you want to listen to it, you probably have to buy the album, like the CD or the record. It's too bad. If I you mean, can find yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Really incredible score. <laughs> so, so fun. Yeah, it's it's an unbelievable score. And I just saw uh, a live orchestra of Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, last week. It was unbelievable. And it's so, it was so cool. Half the time I was watching the film, half the time I was watching the orchestra as they were playing the themes. And there was, it was just like, it, it gives you an appreciation for both the music that was written, but also for the performers because they're sight reading. So they're just like showing up and playing reading it off the paper like well they've rehearsed no they studio composed studio musicians do not rehearse oh i thought you meant the raiders uh show you did yeah well i'm sure they were just sight reading oh they rehearse those do they yeah dude well it, either way like when it it was great watching them yeah, play it's a concert did they get together for rehearsals i guess so yeah yeah they I rehearse don't, i don't know maybe maybe not it's a, sh- you, it's a concert been, i know but i know i know maybe maybe not maybe it, it's like a studio I would put money on them rehearsing. Okay, well, maybe they do. Maybe they do. But I'm it was sure still it was so cool seeing them play yeah. uh, the themes, and half the time I was watching them, and it it gave you it gives you an appreciation for like how many instruments that a composer's writing for, but also his music's so complex, and there's so many layers to it, especially in like the big big films, and it's just like I don't understand how his mind can even make sense of it all. He's just such a genius because. There's so much going on with all of the musicians and the the layers to it. What it's just insane, and the, the to be able to hold have that in your mind and be able to put it on paper because he writes it on pencil, writes it with pen, pencil on paper. He still does. The fact that he can do that with all these instruments and write all of every instrument has so many ups and downs and so many notes that are being played, and it's just it all he has it all makes sense and the timing of it, making it time perfectly for the film. It's so impressive, and when you see it in person, you're like, I can't fathom how somebody can do that in their head. It's just unbelievable. It's wicked smart. Wicked smart. My boy's wicked smart. Let's get into the 1990s. So we have, in 1990, he comes out with Home Alone, which is nominated for uh, an Academy Award, but does not win, as well as, I believe, he won a nominee Stanley and Iris, starring Brad Pitt. I mean, uh, starring uh, Robert De Niro. I wasn't finished with my sentence. Sorry. Could you like? Well, you you were, you got into 1991, man. No, I was talking about the Home Alone. Still, I okay. was talking about how you. No, it was nominated for a Grammy for best original song for oh. for a movie. Okay. Why don't you just let me finish what I'm saying? That was also nominated for an Academy Award, the original song from Home Alone. Okay. Which is somewhere in my memory. Somewhere in my memory. I didn't even know those were the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you hear songs and you you don't even know what the lyrics da, are. Da, uh, da, yeah. Da, da, da. That's pretty much how I thought of it. Then in 1991, he dropped Hook with Steven Spielberg as well as JFK with Oliver Stone. Oh my God! What a fucking year. Hook's great. Hook is so much fun. It's adventurous. It's it's uh, it just so, so light and airy. It's a good time. The music's great. And JFK, I mean, you couldn't make two different scores. It's incredible. <laughs> in 1992, does Far and Away with Ron Howard. And then Home Alone 2, Lost in New York City for Chris Columbus. I didn't know he directed the sequel as well Me either. either. Yeah. And then 1993, obviously Spielberg came out with two movies that year. Mm-hmm. And John did both. Came out with Jaws and Schindler's List. Um, not Jaws. I'm sorry, Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh my god. I just had a, a stroke. You saw Jay. I saw Jay. Jurassic Park in 1993 and Schindler's List in 1993. This might be the best one-two punch in the history of cinema for coming out the same year. Yeah. But he, or even just back-to-back movies for how different they are and how it's impactful a, both films it's possible, are. Possible, yeah. Cuz it's not just that they're great movies, but they are so tonally different. And storytelling wise, musically wise, artistic wise, they are just opposites, and yet they're they're two of the greats, not just of that decade, but of all time. True, but also remember, 1981, 1980 to nineteen eighty two did Empire Strikes Back in nineteen eighty, Raiders of the Lost Ark nineteen ninety one, and then E T in nineteen eighty two. It's pretty fucking bang. It's pretty good <laughs> back to back to back. Uh, but I'm just saying, like these are so different. Yeah. These two films, and I think for a director, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As the director, yeah. And Schindler's List might be, it's up there for his all-time best scores, and it's incredible string work 
uh, remarkable violin solos. Really, the violin solos dominate uh, that the that score. Just like Seven Years in Tibet, Memoirs of, G of a Geisha has a lot of great uh, solo violin as well. But Schindler's List, it's it's just an incredible sense of you feel the tragedy in the music, and the weeping violin solos in that film really capture the essence of what's happening in that story. And it's hard to forget that film, just like how it's hard to forget the music. And on top of that, the music is also unbelievably beautiful as well. Some of the most beautiful things he's ever written. And then to contrast that, Jurassic Park is just so epic and big and, and boisterous and, and remarkable and iconic. Like that, that score is just uh, like on another level. It's unbelievable that he wrote those two in the same fucking year. Jurassic Park's music is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's terrifying at times, but also... That's where he's also done great horror. Yeah. yeah. There's this good horror The there Raptors, sure. the opening yeah. Raptor, yeah. But the music for Jurassic Park, I remember the first time I saw it in theaters. I think I... No, I did... Um, I saw it in theaters like you, three or four years you ago. You went opening night? No, I had <laughs> no, saw a re-release. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I saw it a few years ago in the theater for a re-release, and... The theme when they're playing it and they're coming down the in the chopper into Jurassic Park on Isla Nublar, that was one of the most hair standing moments I've ever had in a in a cinema before. It's just I've seen the movie a dozen times at least, but then to see it in a theater and hear that music, just that scene of the chopper coming down, it was absolutely incredible. It, it blew my mind. And he did such cool like brass woodwinds. Like, I think there are some kind of brass instruments for the raptors, like that, you know what I mean? During the, the raptor attacks. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just like something, it makes your spine tingle. Because what's so brilliant about him is uh, he's, he's always using different instruments. I think he's most defined by a few. Uh, obviously, the French horn he likes to use a lot for his themes, like the Star Wars themes, like some of the Raiders themes. Like, he uses the French horn a ton. And when I saw Raiders, there were five French horns players. Uh, he's great with string work. And then his brass is just otherworldly. Like his, his writing of brass is really incredible. But what was, what was cool about Raiders when I saw it live is I didn't realize there's quite a lot of xylophone in it. So there are two xylophone players doing a lot of work on that score, which I never even realized. Were they and vibraphone or xylophone? Z um, the big long ones. Vibraphone. Vibraphones. And I was like, oh my God. I I've listened to this music so much I didn't realize it was that instrument. Mm -hmm. And so he's he's using instruments that are capturing really unique sounds in ways that you can't you can't even predict and that you you aren't even aware of. And, and to go back to Jurassic Park, of course, part of being a great composer or a great writer is being highly skilled in writing themes and being creative, of course. But also I think what people sort of miss about great composers is of course, when to use music and how to use music, but also when not to use music and when not to, and then let the sound design of the film take over. Mm -hmm. Jurassic Park's a great example because when I think of Jurassic Park, some of the best scenes I think are the sound effects and the sound design of the dinosaurs. For example, when they're outside the raptor tank, uh, little encampment mm -hmm. and cage, and they lower down that cow, there's no music. They're just the sound effects of the goat lowering down, the cow lowering down, and then the whooshing of the grass, the tall grass, and then the attack and the squeals and the screams of the raptors while the characters are watching and listening in horror. The sound design is key there, but adding music there probably takes away from that. Same thing with the T-Rex attack in night when the fences go down. Yeah, There's no music there. We have the rain. And we have the Tyrannosaurus screams, and that's it. That's what's powering the scene, the sound design. But then the great finale of the T-Rex saving the day, killing the Velociraptors, we have great music score to mm -hmm. supplement that, and it's a great climax and a bit, great way for the heroes to escape, and they're saved by the T-Rex. So I think a great composer, not only do they have to be very skilled and creative, but they also have to know where to mu use music and when not to use music. There's a, a great moment. So, the end of Jaws, the final showdown, no music. And it's like the Jaws, and Jaws breaks through the boat, and he's inside the boat. There's no music. You just hear the sound effects of the glass breaking of Brody trying to get out of there. Smile, you son of a bitch. bitch. Bam. And then, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's a great scene with no music, and it's the, the fight in the bar, in, in um, uh, Karen Allen's bar. And it's like the whole 
shootout. You hear the fire. You hear the fists, uh, the flames. It's fantastic. No music at all. It's incredible. And then Saving Private Ryan, Storming of Normandy Beach. No music. Nothing at all until after that battle. Because the, the film opens with them on the boat, no music. You just hear the thrashing of the water. Well, the film so almost, the opening of the cemetery. Sorry, there you sorry. go. There you it's go. Almost, <laughs> got a correct. We got you know, music almost, there. We almost got him. I get music. We there. almost got him, everyone. But when we do go back in time on the boat, no music. You just hear the guy throwing up. You hear the water. Uh, you just feel like you're there with those guys. And then the entire storming of Normandy. There's no music. There's just it's just the gunfire, explosions, and then. After that sequence, we finally get music in uh, the contempt in the period piece. So uh, you, that's an ac- absolutely incredible point. Sometimes, mu- a lack of music really helps the film, and putting music in some scenes that don't need it can take away from the power of those scenes. Exactly. Exactly. Let's keep going through the '90s. We have 1995 Sabrina, directed by Sidney Pollack, and Nixon, directed by Oliver Stone. 1996, we have Sleepers from Barry Levinson. And then in 1997, we have Rosewood, as well as The Lost World, Jurassic Park, Seven Years in Tibet, and Amistad. Seven Years in Tibet is fantastic. It's uh, based on a true story of a, uh, he's not ger- Austrian climber who spends time with the Dalai Lama and lives within the temple the Dalai Lama lives in uh, for seven years, obviously. Uh, it's, but it's a wonderful score, great cello work. Unbelievable strings, and also he used a lot of I don't know what uh, what you would call them, but it's like bells, like yeah, bell instruments from that area in that culture. Uh, it's, it's just incredible, incredible music. And then Amistad, uh, which is one of the best slavery movies ever made, uh, starring Jaimon Hunsu, uh, Matthew McConaughey, incredible score, so powerful. Jurassic World, Lost the par- Jurassic Park Two, The Lost World. It's not something that I've listened to often because the, it's uh, inferior to, I would say, Jurassic Park for sure. And then to round out the 90s, we have Saving Private Ryan in 1998. And then coming back to Star Wars in 1999 with Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Saving Private Ryan is defined by the drums, the military drums, and then the brass. Those sure, are Those sure. are like the two main instrumental mel- uh, instruments that groups that he used in that film. Um, Which is sort of, of the cliche military music yeah. of the World War One, World War Two era. But I'm sure it, it was important for him because it, it brought him back to his roots of writing music for the military. Yeah, of, of his first job. That's a good point. So I'm sure that he he was like, I'm only going to use the kind of music you would hear in military music. Yeah, and then coming back to Phantom Menace and creating one of the biggest bangers of all time. <laughs> 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 it's gonna be one of the best, one of the best tracks in Star Wars ever. And also, does the pod racing have a lack of music? Right? It's been a while since I've seen it. I think it. the pod racing they went no music, at least for some of it. Yeah, but I don't know. But Duel Fates is just one of the best songs ever for Star Wars. It's one of the best tracks he's ever done. Yeah. And also, uh, Angel's Ashes that year, which is a great film uh, about a, 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 pov- a family in poverty in Ireland. Uh, it's, it's a very small film, but it, it's really tragic. It's a great tragedy. All right, let's get into our intermission. Oh, then, yeah. And then we'll get back to Johnny Williams. Johnny! All right, uh, before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to leave those is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Our patrons get awesome perks like weekly bonus episodes as well as access to the ad-free version of every single episode, not to mention per- other perks like free merchandise, video messages, access to our Discord, where we'll be doing watch parties every month, which is a lot of fun. We have one coming up, which is going to be a blast. Office Space. We're going to watch Office Space on Thursday, right? Yeah. Should be an absolute blast. Another great way to support the show is to leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'll read out a written review on Apple Podcasts in just a minute. And at 5,000 Apple ratings, I'll be getting a tattoo of Anthony's Choice. Hopefully, it's not too embarrassing. It's going to be IMAX. It's going to be IMAX on my back. That'd be like a jersey tattoo, just IMAX. <laughs> And then another great way and final great way to support the show is to just share us. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow. So share everyone you know who loves cinema, TV, movies. Share Raiders of Lust podcasts with them today. This episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com and get 10% off your order immediately. They have a huge selection 
pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their gigantic poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting, like that fucking badass Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Poster backlighting you got right Lord of the Rings you. Fellowship of the Poster? Yeah, Fellowship <laughs> of the Poster. <laughs> it's the fourth film of the... Fellowship of the Poster. Fellowship, Fellowship of the Rings We poster. are the Fellowship of the Poster. Look at this thing. Isn't it Look sexy? Look at that backlighting. Unbelievable. Best purchase ever made in my life? Yeah, I think so, I think man. so. I think and I so. used our... I got a discount from Raiders <laughs> 10, <laughs> Fuck of course. Yeah, if you love John Williams movies, whether it be Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jaws, or whatever, MoviePosters.com has... All of those posters. So go there for your poster needs. Whether you need to deck out your place, whether you want to get a gift for the movie lover in your life, go to movieposters.com and use our promo code right now. It's Raiders10 and get 10% off your order immediately. Immediately. Let's head to our intermission. Are you ready? Ready. Movie quote time. You have chosen poorly. (laughs) (laughs) That looks like the cup of a carpenter. (laughs) <laughs> Last Crusade. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You have chosen wisely. wisely. <laughs> I've been so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's my quote. You shook Sinatra's hand. You should have known better. <laughs> this is... Ocean's 13. Yes. <laughs> Danny to uh, Pacino's character. Pacino's char- the Willie Bank. Nice one, man. Thanks. I, f- I figured you'd get an Ocean's one yeah. easily. <laughs> I love those movies so much. I feel like w- I wouldn't call them guilty pleasures of mine because they're all great. They're great. But they are sort of just like uh, they make me feel so happy. It's just a pleasure movie. And I know them so well. <laughs> 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 I guess that's what we're calling it, Anthony. <laughs> James, <laughs> James's pleasure movies are oceans. No, but the, that's what like a like an old man would call like a porno. Yeah, like one of those pleasure movies, <laughs> a right? Pleasure film. <laughs> <laughs> You're in such a boomer. <laughs> pleasure movie. <laughs> All right, guess this movie release year. National Treasure. Two thousand four. Yeah. Easy man. Easy stuff. What year did? This is, I know you love this movie so much. Up in the air, come out. <laughs> <laughs> it's James's favorite screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this screenplay. <laughs> Just kidding. It's really it's a really great screenplay. That's the funny. No, it's a terrific screenplay. <laughs> it's a really good movie. I just hate that it beat Tarantino at the Golden Globes for best original screenplay. Um, <laughs> did it win the Oscar over him too? This, I believe, up in the air, won. Let me double check. Let me see real quick. Up in the air. Yeah. Up in the air. So it came out in 2009. Yeah. Same year as well Inglourious Bastards. That's why I have a bone to pick. It's not the, the movie's fault. It's the. It was nominated for adapted screenplay. But it won the Golden Globe, right? It won the Globe for. Hold on, let me scroll. Because I remember when um, that one for best screenplay, I was like, what, would this be Tarantino's? But it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, one best screenplay motion picture. This is before uh, the Golden Globes made a difference between adapted and original. Yeah. And so it won best screenplay over Inglorious Bastards. Which was shocking. Yeah. But I, it's, a, it's a great script. No, it, it really is a great script and a really good movie. Yeah, but when was the last time you saw someone talking about Up in the Air? <laughs> 2009. <laughs> <laughs> It was a timely, it was a relevant movie yeah, it was for the time. Right after the crash, 2008. It was relevant. It was, it was about people firing other people. So it was very, like, sometimes the academies are like, oh, yeah, it's still relevant. Let's vote yeah. on it. Yeah. Instead of making, you know, one of the greatest scripts ever written in history awarded properly. Yeah, it is what it is. All right, let's move into. You got it right, though. Movie Pop <laughs> Quiz Time, yeah, 2009. <laughs> Who is the oldest person to ever be nominated for an Oscar? Oldest person ever to be nominated for an Oscar. Not win, just be nominated? Nominated. Huh. That is a good question. That's a really good question. Are they an actor? Oh, you want hints now? That's a tough question. No. They're not an actor. Okay. I'm going to say the oldest person ever nominated for an Oscar was... 
<laughs> he's like hitting his. He's like a bobblehead right now, guys. He's stalling. Bernard Herman. Eh. John Williams. Yes. The yes. answer is John Williams. He was nominated for an Oscar in 2022 for The Fablemans at the age of 90 years old. Wow. Nice. Oldest person to ever be nominated for an Oscar. Fuck yeah, man. And he's still going. Great, cr- great trick question. Got him. We got him, everyone. All right. Here's my quiz question. What did George Clooney win his Oscar for? Michael Clayton. Eh. Um... He won. He didn't win Best Director. It's for acting. It's for acting. He won an Oscar for Ocean's Thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> Damn, what did he win an Oscar for? Oh, uh, you don't know this man. Um, psh. you're not gonna get it. I'll tell you. Sure. I could give you a hint. No, you can just tell me. You want a hint? You can just tell me. Syriana. Syriana, that's right. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All right, do we have any haters this week or any, any unsubscribes? Oh yeah, let me let me What pull, are we cooking with, bro? Let me pull what, them up. How are we cooking? I think we're cooking pretty well, man. I think we're we got a stew going on. A stew. <laughs> Ocean 13. <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Good joke. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Okay. Will Middleton on our Furious episode. Gas Town. It's Gas Town. Not Fuel City or Gasoline Wonderland. <laughs> or Gasoline Wonderland. <laughs> I, <laughs> Gasoline Wonderland. <laughs> in my defense, in my defense, I watched the movie like two weeks before we filmed that episode. I, just couldn't, re- I couldn't remember it. <laughs> Gasoline Wonderland. <laughs> Gas Town. <laughs> What do we call it? Like Gas City, I think. I think I call it Gas City. Gas City, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gasoline Wonder Town. <laughs> oh my god, it's funny. It, it killed me. Uh, sport. The Sports Yellow wrote pajamas unsubscribed. <laughs> Were you wearing pajamas? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> or did we say Furiosa was wearing pajamas or something? Was on the Furiosa episode. Yeah, Furiosa. What episode. were you wearing? What was I wearing? Yeah. I don't remember. I was at uh, I was in the UK. Maybe well, it's I probably was <laughs> you were in, you were definitely on a you were definitely on a bed. <laughs> no, I was on a couch. It was a cozy looking couch. It was a very cozy. I couch. think you were probably wearing pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Gasoline Wonderland. <laughs> All right, that's it for our unsubscribes. Thanks, everybody. All right, we have a great <laughs> five star review from Imama, the best of the best of the best. Five stars. Absolute uh-huh. top of the line movie pod for all those film girls and boys out there. Film boys, film girls. Hey, unite. Unite for our show. Thank you so much for the five star written review. Thank you. Appreciate so it, Imama. Now, what is your streaming recommendation, Anthony? I started watching The Sympathizer on Max Park Chan Wook's new film, new series starring Robert Downey Jr. and Sandra Oh. It's uh, really, really great. Obviously, incredibly well directed from The Maestro. Park Chan Wook. It's really cool stuff. Is he doing all the episodes? I believe he did. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. My recommendation is Memory, The Origins of Alien. It's a really cool documentary about the making uh, and behind the scenes of Alien. It's on Prime. Oh, cool. Prime Video. It's really good. That's awesome. When was it made? Um, I think 2018. Uh-huh. Cool. Something like that. All right. Let's get back into our John Williams episode. Let's talk about the turn of the century because in 2000, he made a banger. Oh, fuck yeah. The Patriots. Yeah. Going back to the brass, just an epic, epic war film. The drums. Patriots, awesome. Yeah, it's a really, That's cool a really movie. good movie. Roland Emmerich That's directed a good time. That. Then 2001, we have Artificial Intelligence, another Spielberg film, of course, which is really incredible score. And then the granddaddy of them all, <laughs> Harry Potter in the Sorcerer's Stone. Fuck yeah. This is probably my most listened to Williams score, I would say. Yeah, I, would, yeah, I was going to ask, what, what is the, the most common John Williams played on your Spotify? I got to say it's probably this. And I would say second place might be maybe one of the Star Wars films or not. I would say... What Star Wars tracks uh, albums do you listen to a lot? Honestly, I like uh, a couple of the newer ones. I like Last Jedi a lot. And I like Rise of Skywalker a lot. And then I would say also 
Empire Strikes Back would be my top three listen to for Star Wars. And then also, I really like, I really like uh, Seven Years in Tibet. I listen to uh, that one a lot. Jurassic Park as well. Andy yeah. T. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Answering like me. <laughs> Gave me a list. <laughs> See, I'm not the only one who does it, everybody. <laughs> not the only one. Caught what, right-handed. What's your most listened to? Sorcerer's Stone, baby. Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. And Chamber of Secrets. It's actually probably Sorcerer's Stone than Chamber and Eskin. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. It's like those three. Sorcerer, Chamber, Eskin. My my, those are my top three John Williams scores for sure. It's not even a contest. <laughs> not even. It's almost, it's like every week I'm putting one of them on. I do too. And I also start with... Uh, I have a certain order of the tracks I listen to. <laughs> you know, th I think that one of the reasons why I loved Hogwarts Legacy, the game so much, is the music. And they really, I think, did a great job capturing the feel, mm -hmm. the instruments, the themes of the first two Harry Potter films that John Williams did. Those similar instruments, that magical tone, sort of a fairy tale, and just creating magic with the music. Not that he doesn't with Azkaban, because he does, but Azkaban... It's it's so different than the first two. Of course, we got the theme in there, but he takes a whole new approach with the jazz as well as flutes, the dementors, the dementors, and, and a lot more of a horror aspect with the werewolf scenes and yeah. kind of a really fe felt similar to Close Encounters in a lot of ways as well as Jaws in a lot of ways. Um, like the dun 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 dun. Yeah. Like that's in that's in Azkaban as well. I I think that. It's a lot. It's so fun. But when it comes to the entire album of digestibility, of not listening to while you're watching the film, Sorcerer's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, you can listen to every single track yeah. back and forth, and there's no nothing to be skipped. As command, I would say there might be a few tracks that I kind of skip if I'm just like trying, if I'm just chilling, watch, writing, doing work or something like that. The werewolf stuff is yeah. This it's horror music, yeah, it's, and it's, it's it's not like pleasant to listen to. Yeah. On its own. Yeah. Because there is a lot of horror in Azkaban. Mm -hmm. And so I completely agree. Same thing with me, Azkaban. I have, I listen to about half of it, and, I'll, and I don't listen to the, the other half. It's getting scary for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the high strings. It's like, it's, it works for the film, but on its own, it's like, it's not great to listen yeah. to on its own. But also, he made the best Quidditch song of dun, the entire dun, franchise. Dun, 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 dun. Quidditch third year yeah. in Azkaban. Yeah. What a banger. It's great. What a banger. It's great. Then the Dementor theme in that in that film is fantastic. Like the da, da, da. it's almost Duel of the Fates esque choir singing, really great. There's just so many great themes in the original in the first few Potters that I I just I would have loved to hear in the final film. Yeah, like a lot of the Hogwarts Hogwarts themes, like da, 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 da. like what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> What was that? <laughs> that is not the That's theme. like the the Gryffindor theme. <laughs> that was so bad. That was terrible. I'm not a musician. I'm not a singer. You know what I mean, man. No, I don't. You know what I mean. I don't know what song that was. <laughs> I don't know. What was that? Shut up. <laughs> that was fucking great, man. It's the Hogwarts theme, man. It's the Hogwarts theme. Because what I... So... What the what the other composers did was they would take the Hedwig's theme and put that in. Not in all of them. So it's yeah, on Goblet opens it. No, he they all do it opening a bit. Not in Order of the Phoenix. You sure? You sure about that? <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Half Blood. It's not really in there either. Fuck that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that, Nick Hooper. <laughs> Nicholas Hooper did a great job with Half Blood. Come on. Fuck man. that. <laughs> but they, it would have been, I know they wanted to do their own things, but it still would have been nice to hear many of the melodies that Williams put in there. Yeah, I know, I agree. It's not just the Hedwig's theme melodies, but there are a bunch of, like, the melodies in the Hogwarts. We didn't hear that bum 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 until Deathly Hollows when they yeah. head back when they're back in Hogwarts, when they step which was inside. fitting. Yeah, that's fitting when they head into the Room of Requirement yeah. in Deathly Hollows Part Two. In. That was awesome, yeah. but we hadn't really heard that in so long. Yeah, and it was sort of like that's why I said friend. that's why I said I would love to hear what he would write for the other films. It was oddly nostalgic for a franchise that was still running to yeah. hear it. Yeah, that's what I mean. It was really not in the other movies at all. Yeah. If anything, just 
kind of a little tease here and there. Mm -hmm. But the only thing I can think of is sort of when the title appears in the opening credits with the logo is sort of a theme is there for, for some of them, but... For, for a couple, you're right. Not all of them. Deathly Hallows 1 and 2 don't. He made different themes. For Half-Blood them. doesn't have it either. Fuck that! All right. Well, come on. Journey to the Cave and Half-Blood Prince is a banger That's of a, a great song. song. It's a great song. Banger. It's a great song. I like Half-Blood Prince music a lot. I like I like it. I wish there was some, nice. some themes from it's nice. some J-dubs hey, in there. Thank though. you. Yeah. Thank you. It'd be nice. Thank you. It's just so, it was just they were always kind of lacking compared yeah. to Williams. Anyways, let's talk about 2002 where it was one of his best years ever as a composer. So oh we my have God. Star Wars 2, Attack of the Clones. Are you fucking kidding me? Minority Report, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and Catch Me If You Can, all in 2002 from John Williams. How the fuck did all these movies come out that one year? Oh my God. Yeah, and Spielberg, another year where he has two films coming out. So in 1993, he had Jurassic Park and Schindler's List. In 2002, Steven Spielberg released Minority Report and Catch Me If You Can. Oh my God! Is he the Whoa. best director ever? Probably, honestly. Um, And Minority Report's a great score. And like I said, it's one of his least less appreciated and it's more underrated scores. But it's fantastic. Incredible string work. Uh, I love what he did with the sci-fi um, future uh world that they built in the the music really is phenomenal in that and then catch me if you can like we talked about earlier the incredible songs and the inc incredible music he wrote for that and then chamber of secrets we get the the chamber theme is one of my favorites in potter it's really incredible it's a great theme and can also you sing it for us <laughs> i'm in the chamber <laughs> That's the That's a little theme. better. Yeah. That's a little better. <laughs> and then uh, the the Fox, the Phoenix track is an amazing theme that he made for yeah, that Fox, film. Yeah, Fox. Fox is really great as well as the spiders, the themes yeah. for Aragog, but every time the spiders show up, like... Yeah, the, yeah. Really cool. Yeah, it's fantastic. He did something similar with the, the spider robots in Minority Report. Spiders? Why could it be full of the butterflies? <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? My wand! <laughs> My wand! <laughs> <Harry>! <laughs> <laughs> oh All right, 2004, God. we it have... It really is your favorite one. Harry, <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which we talked extensively about already, bringing the jazz elements, a lot of energy, just like the film changed things yeah. up, the music changed things up as well, and then The Terminal from Steven Spielberg. Very different. It's more... It's a, kind of a romantic comedy, essentially, that film. It's very sweet and heartwarming. Uh, it's very... Uh, on a much different tone than anything he had done and uh, with the Spielberg films so it's a nice uh, refreshing uh, kind of tone for both of them all right you ready for 2005 we have another double Spielberg year oh I God. another year St Steven Spielberg came out with two movies this in 2005 insane. he dropped War of the Worlds and Munich what the fuck? both incredible movies and then we also have Star Wars episode 3 Revenge of the Sith and Memoirs of Geisha 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 <laughs> <laughs> I was way off. Geisha. Geisha. When you read it. When you read it. Anyways. 2005. Steven Spielberg did two movies again. Revenge of the Sith is probably my favorite prequel score. Yeah, it's my favorite prequel score. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, just Anakin versus Obi-Wan. Uh, uh, not Leia. Fuck. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's her name? Help me out. Padme? Padme's theme. <laughs> Padme's theme is great. It's great. Also... Well, in, I mean, the whole Mustafar sequence is yeah. incredible. And then Anakin's Dark Side. Yeah. I mean, Anakin's Dark Deeds. Incredible musical sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much to it. It's it's definitely top-tier Star Wars scores. It's, I would say it's top three Star Wars scores. Up there. Plus, Absolutely. again, War of the Worlds is really incredible. It really World is. War of the Worlds is great. It's a great score. And Munich's Munich's really good too. It's it's a it's different than what he's normally mm -hmm. done. I feel like, but that story that movie's so unique to Steven Spielberg's career as well. It's probably of sort of yeah. like we so, we have these t anti terrorist terrorists. Yeah, this sort of organization, yeah. these secret agents. Who, that's who, you could argue who they are, what yeah. they are. Yeah. But they're obviously hired to take out terrorists who are responsible for Munich bombings. And it's also. One of Spielberg's most underappreciated films. Munich might be his most underrated film. It's, it's really good. Incredible. It's incredible. If you haven't seen it, like, if you want to watch someone who fucking is probably the greatest director of all time, Munich is a good example of that. With the, how he how he made that film, it's insane. 
the whole blocking, hotel explosion scene is really, really great. Yeah, the blocking, the framing, the long takes, the the complex camera work, the direction. It's just, I watched that film last year, and it absolutely floored me. It, I was just, I was mind blown by that movie's direction. Yeah. And then in 2008, he made Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's good. It's great. Of course, it's, it's Steven. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and George. I mean, John. All and, right, let's move on to the 2010s now. We have 2011, we have The Adventures of Tintin and War Horse. Great scores. Tintin's really, really fun. Really fun movie. And then 2012, Lincoln. Man, Steven Spielberg makes so many movies. All three of those movies were directed by Steven Spielberg, by the way. Lincoln uh, again. Another year where he dropped two movies. 2011, 2011. Spielberg drops Adventures of Tintin and War Horse. So different too. The the completely different movies. How does he direct so many movies? Because he's awesome. He's just a man. And then Lincoln, obviously going back to the military roots, and that score is great. Um, I know it put you to sleep though. What Tintin? Lincoln. No Lincoln. <laughs> I did fall asleep during Lincoln. I did. <laughs> Listen, I respect the. We're filming. the West Newton Theater. James passed out <laughs> twice. <laughs> it's just a bunch of old guys talking in a room here, then a bunch of old guys talking in a room there, a bunch of old guys talking in a room there, a bunch of old guys talking in a room there. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was leaning forward like enraptured, like, "Oh my god, this is awesome!" I'll have to see it again. I haven't seen it. Since. You haven't seen it since. I've seen bits of it here and there. Watch it. Oh, I will. I appreciate it a lot more. I'm sure. I was a kid back then, man. I was 21. <laughs> yeah, you were a kid. I was, I was you weren't the cinephile you are today. I was not. I was not. Yeah, you were like, Anthony dragged me to the fucking Lincoln. <laughs> no, I was so excited about it. I was watching. I was a big movie person back then. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And then in 2013, he dropped The Book Thief. Great score. Uh, it's incredible music, and it's one of my favorites to listen to out of all of his scores, honestly. 2015, he made Star Wars The Force Awakens, which I think has so many great tracks, and Ray's theme is really terrific in that movie. Kylo well is Kylo awesome, Ren. yeah. 2016, uh, team up with Spielberg again for the BFG, the Big Friendly Giant. Big I, fucking giant. The Big Fucking Giant. <laughs> Plus, their first collaboration with Mark Rylance, and they ended up making a bunch of movies together since. And then 2017, Dear Basketball. Oh, which, the Kobe film. The Kobe film. Very unfortunate. R.I.P. And then Last Jedi in 2017 with Ryan Johnson and The Post with Steven Spielberg all in 2017. Oh, The Post is so good. It's such a good movie. Have you seen the post? Um, the one is that the one with Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, yeah, I've seen that. So it's so fucking good. Yeah, and the, like he's just like moving the camera, blocking through like these huge rooms with like fifty people, and it's just like how does he figure out how to block these scenes? It's insane. I really like the Je Last Jedi score. Yeah, it's really great. There's some great stuff. The spark, the, the new trilogy. I think the music is better than the movies. Yeah, I would say I would agree with that. Yeah, music is better than the movies. 2018. So. John William, I mean, John Williams did star, Solo, A Star Wars Story, but he, I believe he only did the he theme. He didn't do it. He just wrote a theme for Han the Solo. The opening theme. Yeah. Not the opening theme. It's just like Han Solo's theme. Okay. And, then, and then John, John Powell, Powell made the, the music. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what it was. It's a good score. It's very good. And then the, and the theme's great. The Han Solo theme's fucking awesome. <laughs> then Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker in 2019 <laughs> with J.J. Abrams. I like The Rise of Skywalker. I had a good time. At the cinema at Rise of Skywalker. We all know this, Anthony. I had a, I enjoyed that experience. I cool. liked it. Good for you. <laughs> We're all happy that you did. The rest of us are just. <coughs> it's you know, also, the, I think the best. On. It's the best score of the that trilogy, Rise of Skywalker. Probably. I think it's really fantastic. All right, now what has John done lately? Obviously, in 2022, he was nominated for the Fablemans. Great score. And then last year, he released. Music for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. He won a Grammy for Helena's Theme, which is a great theme. Grammy Award for Best Instrumental Composition. I didn't even know that was a category. Now you do. How doesn't he have more Grammys then? Well, I mean, he's got 76 nominations and 24 wins. It's quite a lot of Grammys. So his most popular tracks on Spotify are, to no surprise, Duel of the Fates, The Imperial March, the, the Emperor's March. The <laughs> Anthony. All right, Gaisha. <laughs> Fuck off. Uh, the Jurassic Park theme. Across the Stars, the love theme from Star Wars Attack of the Clones, which is really phenomenal. What a, what a great theme. Really phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> that's phenomenal. <laughs> that's really good. Uh, the theme from Schindler's List. <laughs> <laughs> really phenomenal. <laughs> really phenomenal. It's really phenomenal. <laughs> that's how you said it, man. It's living in LA too long, man. <laughs> it changes you. Guess who I saw yesterday? <laughs> my God! Like I was. Like, I went to Blue Bottle. I was at Whole Foods. <laughs> Got burritos. That's so funny. It's hilarious. <laughs> like, hilarious. Then at number six, we have Hedwig's theme. Then the prologue, Sorcerer's Stone, so the opening scene. Uh, the Cantina Band <laughs> in, <laughs> in uh, Return. And then Star Wars main theme, New Hope. And then Leaving Hogwarts from Sorcerer's Stone. I'm not really going home. Not, not going really. home. Not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a really phenomenal. <laughs> it's, really, it's really phenomenal. I'm not going home. It's not phenomenal. Really, really uh, phenomenal. Hagrid. Hagrid. I'm not going home. <laughs> like, so I'm, so I'll be back. Like, I'll be back in like a couple months. <laughs> I'm not really leaving. <laughs> oh my god. Oh man. <laughs> oh my god, dude. That was funny. I think that ET is also one of his great masterpieces. I don't. We didn't really touch on it that much. But E.T. is wonderful. And our, we it's saw... Really it. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. We've talked about it a lot, though. Yeah. Recently. The the finale is incredible. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> really, really fucking great. Boom, 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 boom. But it's also so heartfelt. Yeah. It's a very heart heart a heartstring score. I think it's his most magical music outside of the Harry Potter franchise. I agree. Yeah. Because magic happens in that film, but mm -hmm. the, the whole chase of the kids on the bikes with E.T. in the front in the milk crate, and then the first time they fly in the air with E.T. What an experience. We didn't see when we were kids in theaters. It's really phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> when we saw the, the what was it, the forty year anniversary? anniversary? Fifty year anniversary? Third, forty year. We saw it in theaters and IMAX yeah. last year. Yeah. Holy shit. I felt like I was floating in the air. It was the the most I've smiled in a movie since Top Gun Maverick, I think. Same. And Same. It, it felt so magical to see that in theaters, but specifically that moment, that music, then the final chase, that 10-minute track of the kids chasing with E.T. to get him back to the forest. Mm -hmm. Incredible, man. After the, after he, the, 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 he comes back to life. I'd put it— I, Okay. We're going to do something tough now. We're going to do our top five John Williams scores. You're going to make your top five. I'm going to make my top five? Top five. We're going to do it right now without prep. Just let's fucking go. All right, give me give me 14 seconds to write this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write mine down as well. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba 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 -ba. ba 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 How do you? Oh, man, this is tough. Oh my god, it's tough. Like, how do you pick five? Buh, 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 buh. Oh, I got this. I got it. I got it. Are you sure? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the Kool Aid guy. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> that Family Guy joke. Yeah. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a pretty tough list to make. I think I have it though. Yeah, I'm good. Do, do you have yours? Do yours first. Why is he not ready? Not ready. You're not ready, so you go. Yeah, first. I'll, I'll go with mine first. Give me one sec. Let me finish it off. Um, actually, hold on. Hold on. Hold, please. Hold, please. Is memoirs of a Gaisha there? Of Gaisha, yeah. <laughs> memoirs, memoirs of Gaisha. Okay, my. <laughs> Number five is going to be E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Number four, I have Raiders of the Lost Ark. Number three, I have Jaws. Number two, I have Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. And then number one, I have Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Those are my top five John Williams scores. Well done. Thank you, sir. Mine are, at number five, Jurassic Park. At number four, Raiders of the Lost Ark. At number three, E.T., the extraterrestrial, 
arc <laughs> terrestrial. <laughs> it's really fantastic. <laughs> it's really phenomenal. <laughs> it's phenomenal. <laughs> and number two, Empire Strikes Back. And then number one, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Copycat. <laughs> I think we're twins. <laughs> That's why he had me go first because he was. I wanted to steal. He from changed you. one yeah. up. He put Jurassic Park in there. I mean, it's it's, it's phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> it's really phenomenal. All right, John Williams is the goat. He's the best. He's he's really terrific, and it's crazy how many movies he's done. It's crazy how many Spielberg movies Spielberg has made too. Yeah, it's wild. I think that was was it four years where Steven Spielberg has made and released two movies, two great movies. Every time. Yeah. Of course, movies take years to make, but it's crazy that that's happened four times from the same mm-hmm. year. Yeah, it's it's impressive. What a guy. What a guy. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode of John Williams, a career spotlight on the maestro, the best film composer of all time. Thank you so much. Be sure to become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple, and take care. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a mirror image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.